and of 34th Division World War II veterans in the audience, could you raise your hand? That's great. That's great. Welcome, and uh, if this is your first time, a special welcome. Well, the program tonight, and, and I know that there's going to be some people because of the weather that will be coming in, so just come in and, and, and take a seat. The program this evening is going to be in two parts. One is a historical overview of the 34th Division in North Africa and in Italy, or really the mobilization and through. Uh, that's going to be given by Jack Johnson, and then we're going to turn it over and have a panel, and that will be some gentlemen that we'll talk about later. The names you see up here, they've been on the program, and uh, they will tell some of their memories, sad, happy, uh, of their experiences in uh, the 34th Division. Jack, why don't you come forward and let me help you uh, get connected. Well, I you're all right. It's an honor for me to be here. Uh, in many ways, I think it's uh, apropos that we have weather like this, because the 34th during World War II certainly experienced stuff like this quite a bit. And we'll talk about that later. We're here to talk about the 34th Red Bull Division. Official nickname, Red Bull, was actually given to it by the German Army in Italy, who referred to those soldiers who wore the black and red patches as Red Devils or Red Bulls in the latter day uh, name stuck. By those who served in it, however, it was often called the Hard Luck Division. Always in combat, never in the news. It was the first American division to be sent overseas. It fought with distinction in Tunisia and North Africa, and then up the boot of Italy with bravery and dogged determination in some of the uh, toughest conditions that uh, ever confronted an army in what often was referred to as the Forgotten Front. In the end, they amassed more days in combat than any other American division during the war. My role today, as Don said, is to try to provide some kind of an overview um, and uh, perhaps a bit of context uh, so that you understand how that fit into the bigger picture. That's very tough to do because there's so much material in so little time. So I know I'm going to be leaving out a lot of important topics. I also uh, feel a little bit presumptuous standing up here uh, because I wasn't there. I have a few gray hairs, um, but I'm not in the same league with many of you out there. Uh, my only first-hand experience with World War II is a memory of my dad uh, coming home from the war. I remember his uniform and sitting on his lap and asking him about the ribbons, ribbon bars that were on his service coat. I suppose I was about two and a half years old or so at the time. So uh, for those of you who were there, if I say something that doesn't quite ring true with your experience, I hope you'll be forgiving of me. 34th Division was created during World War I. It was a National Guard division uh, with troops coming from Minnesota, Iowa, the Dakotas, and Nebraska. They trained at Camp Cody, New Mexico. Uh, which was a desert-like area not far from the Mexican border, and that provided the basis for the design of their patch, which was a bovine skull superimposed over the shape of a Mexican water jug. After World War I, the division was reorganized with National Guardsmen from Minnesota, Iowa, and the Dakotas. It was called into federal service for one year of what they called precautionary training, federalized on February 10, 1941 and sent to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. When war finally broke out, December 1941, all enlistments were immediately extended for the duration of the war. The division was hastily moved to Fort Dix, New Jersey, and it was reorganized in January of 1942 from its old square configuration of four infantry regiments to the newer, modern, triangularized configuration of three infantry, regiments, the 133rd, 135th, and the 168th, supported by four infantry or artillery battalions, the 125th, the 151st, the 175th, those three used the, uh, the 105s, and the 
and then the 185th fired the 155 Howard. Uh, I think we're going to start here with our slides, if we can figure out how this works. Do I point it anywhere special? Do we do? The legs down here a little bit. Maybe we'll leave a little light. As I said, the 31st was the first American division to be uh, deployed overseas. Within five weeks of Pearl Harbor, the first elements of the division secretly shipped out for Belfast, Northern Ireland. The first red bull off the boat was Private Milborn Hinky from Hutchinson, Minnesota. He was the first Yank to land in Europe, January 26, 1942. This is a picture that appeared in the Belfast newspaper of the 34th. Uh, probably on the dock area someplace, uh, as they were getting off the boat. By the end of May, the entire division was training in Northern Ireland and Scotland. And during this time, the elite 1st Ranger Battalion was formed under the command of one of the division's officers, Captain William Darby, who had been brought in to serve as the general's aide. Uh, division commander at that time was uh, Russell Hart. And he was told to organize a commando-style uh, battalion. And 80% uh, of that unit's first volunteers came from the 34th Division. It later on became famous as Darby's Rangers. The picture I'm showing you up here is service battery of the 125th Field Artillery that was taken in Northern Ireland when they were there in training. It was initially hoped that a Western Front could be established by 19, or in 1942, by means of a cross-channel invasion uh, of France. But it was soon evident that the Allies were simply not prepared to do that. Uh, the British were pushing hard for American support in the Mediterranean. And so in July 1942, it was decided that a second front should be a southern front, with an attack on Axis forces in North Africa. The North African campaign had a number of important objectives. The two most immediately important ones were to divert German resources away from the Soviet front, relieving some of the pressure on the Red Army, which was in crisis there in the summer of 1942, and to draw the German army away from uh, the threat that it was making to the vital oil supplies of the Middle East. Other objectives were to reconstitute the French army as an ally by gaining French-controlled Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria, to open the Mediterranean Sea to Allied shipping, and of course to provide a stepping stone for further operations in the Mediterranean. The invasion itself was named Operation Torch. It called for simultaneous landings to be made near the Atlantic port of Casablanca in Morocco and in the Algerian ports of Oran and Algiers. And, uh, whoops, wait a minute here. Pushed the wrong one, I think. Got one of these little red things here. Casablanca here, Iran, and Algiers. Small contingents of British troops were then to seize ports in eastern Algeria while a ground column headed for Tunisia in a race to get there before the Germans could move in. 34th Division commander, which at that time then was Charles Ryder, was in charge of the Eastern Task Force. That was the one that was to land at Algiers. Now, as it turned out, in late October, just as preparations for the invasion were in their final stages, the British 8th Army under Montgomery soundly defeated Rommel's forces in El Alamein in Egypt. Now, Rommel retreated westward. It doesn't show here so much on this particular map, which is looking down on the Mediterranean from, from a, an angle that we're not usually used to looking at. Uh, but the, uh, he retreated westward, westward through Libya and, and towards Tunisia. If Operation Torch and the subsequent sweep into Tunisia was fast enough, then Rommel's German and Italian army could be defeated with converging attacks. That was the idea. Two weeks later, on November 8, 1942, Operation Torch was launched. And here is where the combat history of the 34th Division begins. Elements of the division landed at Algiers. Once again, that was the point right 
here. In the pre dawn hours of November 8th, now secret efforts to persuade the Vichy French to not oppose those landings had fallen short of success, and there was sporadic fighting on all three landing sites. At Algiers, the most serious resistance was encountered by the 3rd Battalion, 135th Infantry, which was assigned to secure the dock area. The French fought back, and the battalion sustained 48 casualties, 15 killed, 33 wounded, before they were surrounded and forced to surrender to the French. Now, this was arranged with the French two days later, and on November 11th, Allied forces began to push eastward into Tunisia. It was at this time that the 34th also chopped up another first. The first American artillery fire to be leveled against German forces uh, in World War II came from B Battery 175th Field Artillery at Menjez El Bab, Tunisia, using a British 25 pounder. And that was November 17, 1942. By early January, the campaign was bogged down by massive logistical problems and unexpectedly stiff opposition from German reinforcements that had been rushed in by way of Sicily. Elements of the division were also widely scattered at this time. It had taken two months before all of the men of the 34th had been shipped into North Africa. And various division units were scattered everywhere, attached piecemeal to other commands. This is just a quick picture of what Christmas 1942 would have looked like to many of the men of the 34th. The slide gives a picture of northeastern Tunisia. Rommel's army had been moving westward here to link up with the uh, German army, uh, Italian German forces, which had been reinforced, and they were under uh, General uh, uh, von Arnhem in the north. And in mid-February 1943, he took a sharp left turn right here and struck hard with armored forces against the U.S. Second Corps at Fade Pass. The Second Corps was commanded by Lord Lloyd Friedendahl. 34th had been assigned to the 2nd Corps, and at Fade Pass, Rommel's 21st Panzer Division quickly overran the thinly held positions of the 168th Infantry Regiment. Rommel then continued on through towards Kazarine Pass, where he broke through four days later, intent on taking Tevisa, which was a major Allied supply base. His plan was to do a flanking maneuver, push in uh, a northwesterly direction towards the coast, trapping some Allied units and forcing others back into Algeria. The German breakthrough at Fame Pass was costly for the 34th. About half of the 168th Regiment was killed or captured at Fame Pass. Now, as you probably all know, Rommel was not able to sustain uh, his attack for reasons I don't have time to go into here. But Kazarine certainly was a big wake-up call for the U.S. Army. Several changes were quickly made. From here on out, there would be less intermingling of troops from different nationalities. Troops would fight under their own commanders, and a division would, to the extent possible, live, train, and fight as a division. Friedendahl was relieved of command and replaced, at least for temporary purposes, by General Patton, was given command of the 2nd Corps. Among other things, Patton required that neckties, steel helmets, be worn at all times. Patton also challenged Rommel to a man-to-man -man duel, tank duel. We'll settle matters, matters that way, we'll put the troops on both sides as spectators. That idea was uh, particularly appealing to men of the 34th who were tired of wearing neckties. <laughs> <laughs> This shows the area around Fade Pass. You get an idea there of, of what the terrain looked like. After Kazarine, the Allies were able to again seize the initiative. By mid-April, the Axis, consisting of five Italian divisions and nine German divisions, had moved into a strongly held defensive perimeter in northeast Tunisia. <coughs> Roughly right here. 
side was the sea coast, and the other was about a 140 mile long range of hill and mountains that formed a natural barrier. Our objective was to break through this barrier and take the ports of Bezert and Tunis, the process forced the surrender of enemy troops. Allied air forces had at this point essentially blocked all enemy transport into or out of Tunisia. So there was no chance for escape and no opportunity for resupply. Command of the 2nd Corps at this point had been passed on to Omar Bradley, and so Patton could prepare for the invasion of Sicily. The 2nd Corps was given the northern sector, and its assignment was to move on desert. This was the area here. Here's desert. along a 40-mile front. It was a rugged battle area with a jumbled mass of hills and mountains. Beyond the hills lay the strategic crossroad city of Mature and then Bezer. There were two natural corridors through these hills and mountains. One was a mouse trap, as Bradley put it, and he refused to be drawn into it. The other was dominated by a peak that was given the name Hill 609. Now all of these hills, peaks, were named according to their height. So it was 609 meters high, which is about 2,000 feet. And it was the highest point in that part of the region. That hill and the other hills immediately surrounding it had to be swept clear of the enemy. It was the key to mature, desert, and ultimate victory. The critical task of taking it was given to the 34th Division. The surrounding hills all bristled with strong enemy artillery, mortar, and machine gun positions. But one by one, they were taken. After a day of pounding by the artillery, a direct assault on Hill 609 uh, was begun early on April 29th, when the 3rd Battalion, 135th Infantry, moved to the base of the hill and captured a small village. From there, the 34th, with tank support from one company of the 1st Armored Division, began an all-out assault under intense fire. This shows it from the hill, or from the, uh, from the sky. You can see the city of Mature up there. After two days, the hill was finally taken. And with Hill 609 in American hands, the enemy defense line quickly collapsed. Mature fell, and then desert and Tunis on May 15, 1943, the enemy surrendered and the battle for North Africa was over. The campaign had taken six months. 34th casualties in that campaign was 4,049, of which half were missing in action. Next came Italy. Sicily was the stepping stone. Now, the 34th did not take part in the Sicilian campaign, which was relatively short. The Allies pushed enemy forces out of Sicily in July and August, and the success of that uh, prompted the Italian government to drop out of the war. The invasion of Italy began with the British 8th Army under Montgomery, followed a week later on September 9th by the U.S. 5th Army under Mark Clark at Salerno, about 25 miles south of Naples. You can see that there. It was hoped that our attack on Italy would persuade Germany to cut their losses in Italy and quickly retire, retire to a defensive line somewhere in the north, perhaps along the foothills of the Alps. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out that way. The 34th was designated as a reserve force for the invasion, but its 151st Field Artillery <coughs> Battalion was temporarily detached to help the 36th Division establish a beachhead at Salerno. The Germans had launched a bewildering night counterattack on the beachhead just as the 151st was landed. The artillery men turned it back. The chief of staff for the 36th later commented, quote, the beachhead would have been destroyed had it not been for the early arrival of the 151st. They shot it out with the Germans for eight days, fired more ammunition in those days than they had in the entire Tunisian campaign. So the rest of the 34th arrived at Salerno a few weeks later, after the beach had been, had been secured. It's a picture of the 
and from the division loading up into an LCI. The initial Allied objective was to force the enemy out of southern Italy and to capture the Winter Line, a formidable chain of German defensive positions which spanned the entire peninsula above Naples. On the east, the British 8th Army moved more or less parallel to the American 5th Army, which was on the west. So the 8th Army came up this way, moving here, the 5th Army. This shows the position of that winter line. The winter line actually consisted of three different lines, each a progressively tougher barrier than the one before it. First was the Barbara line, which is down in here, and then the Bernard line, which is sometimes referred to as the Reinhardt line, following up here, and finally the Gustav line, which was a system of sophisticated interlocking defenses that the Germans were determined not to yield. And it was anchored by a superb natural fortress called Monte Cassino. Here's the Gustav line, all the way down Monte Cassino here. These defenses were made possible by the fact that there were so few well-defined corridors through which a motorized army could pass. There were only two roads between Naples and Rome. Both of them had been laid out on routes that the uh, Roman Empire had built 2,000 years earlier. One was Highway 7, referred to in ancient times as the Appian Way. This one here followed along the coast. And the other was Highway 6, that threaded its way through the mountains. Now, the virtue of Highway 6 to the Allies was that once it passed Casino, it led into the Leary River Valley, here, which was thought of as the gateway to Rome, much easier way to enter in. And that's the route that was decided upon. If the Allies could break into the valley, they could move on Rome with greater ease. But to get there, they would first have to overcome the Barbara Line, pass through a narrow mountain corridor called the Giano Gap, and then break through the main winter line, uh, fortifications at Casino, and along the Rapido River, which was a natural barrier that ran across the entrance to the valley. Fighting from Salerno to the winter line was as hard and unforgiving as ever to face an army. Not only was it the worst combat terrain in Europe, the campaign took place in constant mud, snow, rain, wind. Uh, the rains came early that year in 1943 and with unusual force. And then there was the Volturno River, a formidable barrier that was heavily defended. It had to be crossed three times by the division because of the way it always bent back and forth on itself. The pattern of fighting for the 34th became all too familiar. You would fight bitterly for a hill, you would take it eventually, and then you would move on to the next hill. The Germans mined wired and fired upon every passage. The entire route was perfect for defensive operations. But gradually, one by one, the strategic objectives were taken. Monte Pantano, San Vittori, Monte Lacchiaia, Monte Trocchio, the Rapido River. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was often needed in order to root the enemy out of his holes in the mountains or the rubble of buildings. Picture of the some men from the 135th. That's a dead German sniper in, on the cart there in the middle, um, taken at San Vittori in uh, early January 1944. Men frequently fought in regions which could only be supplied by animal pack trains. Monte Pantano exemplified how difficult it was to fight in the rocky hills and mountains. Pantano, 3,000 feet high, was fissured by gullies, peppered with enemy dugouts, concealed mortar and artillery positions, minefields. Enemy weapons were often placed on reverse slopes and in ravines to bring fire on any approaching force. The Red Bull attack on Monte Pantano 
was led off by the 168th Infantry on November 29th, and by the time it was relieved by the 135th Infantry, after six days of fighting, the 168th had lost all of its battalion commanders, together with 33 other officers, 386 men killed or wounded. It had expended 6,800 rounds of 81 millimeter mortar ammunition, 3,000 hand grenades, 7,500 artillery rounds, and 400,000 rounds of rifle and machine gun ammunition. And only one knob of Monte Pantano was in our possession. Now this picture here is actually not Monte Pantano. I didn't have one. This picture shows the mountain area near a casino, and I think that's a German soldier that's looking out at it, but it gives you a, some idea of what the terrain was like. Within six weeks of the Salerno landings, our troops were tired, wet, cold, morale was flagging, enemy resistance was consistently tougher than expected, and there was no immediate hope for improvement. To restore maneuver to the battlefield, Allied leaders decided upon an end run. To carry out an end Phibius landing behind enemy lines at Angio, 35 miles southeast of Rome. <coughs> Here's Casino over here. The plan called for the 5th Army to land its 6th Corps, consisting of 400,000 troops, at Anzio and rapidly drive inland toward Rome. The strategy that was designed to also cut enemy supply and communication lines north of the Gustav Line it could also force the enemy to turn some of its resources away from the Gustav line in order to contain the thrust at Anzio. But like so many things in the Italian campaign, it didn't go as planned. The 6th Corps landed at Anzio on January 22nd unopposed, but the Corps commander decided to dig in at the beachhead before launching his attack inland. And that was all it took for the German army to move 700 or 70,000 troops uh, quickly into the Anzio area. And the situation quickly became a nightmare. The beachhead and ships near the shore were under incessant attack and shelling from uh, artillery and dive bombers. We managed to uh, beat off a series of powerful German counterattacks, but their excellent defensive positions in the foothills surrounding Anzio effectively halted our breakout. In the meantime, German defense of the Gustav Line was as determined as ever. Anzio had not drawn enemy resources away from his defense of the line as we expected. Ironically, it now became imperative for the rest of the 5th Army to break through the Gustav Line defenses so that we could draw the enemy away from the beleaguered Anzio beachhead. Army, which at this point was the British 10th Corps, a French expeditionary force, and the 2nd Corps, which included the 34th Division, was to attack toward the Rapido and Garigliano rivers down in this area here. They would then cross the rivers, take the high ground on both sides of the Leary Valley, and advance north to link up with the Anzio Beachhead. The plan quickly bogged down, however. The British encountered heavy resistance at the Garigliano River and were not able to move forward. This left uh, the flank of the U.S. Second Corps unprotected as it prepared to storm the Rapido River the next day with the 36th Division. And the red ones here are the uh, site of attack for the 36th Division on the river. The attempting crossing, the attempted crossing of the river. And this shows the repeat of it. Would have been difficult in any case, but under withering enemy fire, it turned out to be a disaster. The 36th Division suffered severe casualties trying to cross it, with one entire regiment virtually wiped out. They were unable to break through into the valley. And so General Clark decided to try and outflank it by launching attacks over high ground northeast of Casino. The job went to the 34th Division, with aid from French troops and the one remaining regiment 
of the 36th Division. The division attacked the network of hills near a casino. Let me give you some idea. Here's the town of Casino. Here's the abbey, which was up at the high point. And there were a network of hills in here. The division attacked the network of hills near a Casino and attempted to storm the abbey itself that stood on the summit. Over several days of fighting, 34th was able to establish a foothill on the ridges behind the monastery to entrench itself in the city of Casino itself. But the Germans defied all attempts to wrest control of the city or other nearby positions. Stiff resistance was encountered at every turn. The fighting was close and intense with every house and rock pile in contention. The 35th, 135th Regiment was this area up here, the 168th down here through the middle, and the 133rd was down in here into the town. In the town itself, artillery barrages had created piles of rubble that gave protection and hiding places for German troops who refused to withdraw or surrender. In a classic description of the fighting, Red Bull veterans still recall an official communique by one of their lieutenants who said, uh, in talking about the activity of the day, quote, today we captured two living rooms and a bedroom. <laughs> Finally, after four weeks of constant fire, retreated, repeated attacks and counterattacks, and seemingly endless days and nights on the barren hills exposed to cold rain, wind and snow, the depleted ranks of the 34th were exhausted. The battle came to an end for the 135th and the 168th regiments on the night of February 14 and 15, when they were relieved by the 4th Indian Division. The 133rd Regiment was not able to be relieved until uh, February 22nd, after the bombing of the Abbey. When the 34th was finally pulled out, many of our men had stuck it out for so long and suffered so much that they had to be lifted bodily from their foxholes and carried down the steep descents to the positions in the rear. Some historians contend that the assault on Casino was ill-advised, that the eventual gains did not justify the costs or the destruction of the Abbey, which was bombed into oblivion the day after the 135th and the 168th left the line. But that doesn't diminish Casino as the battle of battles for the 34th Division. It symbolized a level of sacrifice, determination, and courage, which is second to none in the war. Eventually, it took five divisions. The total destruction of the abbey, the town, and the surrounding countryside, and three and a half months of continuous battle to drive the Germans out of Casino. This shows uh, what the destruction looked like how well you could see it uh, at the end here. There's the, the remains of the monastery up there. This was something called Castle Hill, uh, and what's left of the town down here. <coughs> After Casino, the division was sent uh, for a short rest, and fresh replacement troops were brought in to replace the depleted ranks. And then in mid-March, it was sent to Anzio, where Allied forces were still stalled on the beachhead. The division's breakout finally came on May 23rd, followed by the drive on Rome. Men of the 135th Regiment, who uh, were among the first to enter the city, they were attached with the 1st Armored Division, and they went in on June 4th, 1944. They mopped up snipers around the Colosseum that evening. The 133rd Regiment, in the meantime, was taking the vital port of Citiva Vecchia, northwest of Rome. Elsewhere, off the coast of Normandy, the Allies were about to invade France, and Germany was now defending itself on all three fronts. After Rome, the division continued on up the boot of Italy through heavily entrenched German positions. Resistance was stubborn, but declining in strength, as the 34th routed Germans out of Belvedere, San Vincenzo, Cecina, Lake Park, Pisa, and others. It's a picture of uh, some men from the 135th going through the Bornholm. 
summer of July 1944. This is a picture uh, in the Leghorn area, taken July 22, 1944, 135th Infantry, moving up to the line as, uh, as civilians are evacuating to the rear. Then came the Arno River, the Gothic Line along the Apennines, finally a bold campaign for the Po River Valley, which contained 80% of Italy's war industries. The division was ordered to hold and wait during the winter of 1944-45, just south of Bologna. This shows a little bit of the elegant living conditions they had that winter. Um, says Company B, 135th Infantry, in January 1945. Uh, these are some men from 135th uh, watching the rising Adisi River, wondering whether they need to pull up stakes or not. I don't know if they ultimately did. They did in February 1945. The final offensive came in mid-April. The German defense wall caved in quickly, and Bologna was taken. It's a picture of the victory celebration in Bologna. The 34th was the first uh, division allowed to enter the city. <coughs> After Bologna, the once powerful German army began to quickly disintegrate, and their retreat soon became a rout. On May 2nd, 1945, the remnants of the 75th German Corps surrendered 40,000 men to the Red Bulls near Milan. And ironically, the surrendered troops included the German 34th Infantry Division. The war in Europe came to an end a few days later, and with some Red Bulls positioned on the borders of France and Switzerland. <coughs> this is a cartoon that appeared in the Stars and Stripes magazine by Bill Malden uh, towards the end of the war there. I don't know if it shows, but uh, down on the bottom it says, uh, the doc says it's nothing serious, just hardened arteries. It <laughs> uh, was a recognition of the length of time that the division had been in combat. After some rest, sightseeing and occupation duty, the 34th sailed home in October. Its men were mustered out on November 3, 1945, at Camp Patrick Henry, Virginia. Of the several thousand Midwestern guardsmen who left for Camp Playboy on a cold February day, 1941, who had been among the first American troops to land in Europe. Only a handful remained with the division at the end. Casualties, uh, illness, transfers, and rotations out accounted for the rest. The division had completed a record that included 517 days of frontline combat and five major campaigns. More combat days than any other American division in any theater of the war. With some elements, the division credited with over 600 days of combat. Casualties including 3,737 killed, 14,165 wounded, 3,460 missing in action. They had given out 1,072 silver stars, 98 distinguished service crosses, 11 medals of honor. In addition to the personal awards and decorations, the division garnered three presidential unit citations, 15 unit commendations, and 525 separate division citations. The 100th Nisi Infantry Battalion, which was composed of U.S. citizens of Japanese descent and had been attached to the 34th for most of the Italian campaign, became the most highly decorated battalion in the U.S. Army. This is a picture, by the way, of uh, General Bolte. He was the division commander at the end of the war, Charles Bolte, uh, pinning a legion of merit on uh, Staff Sergeant John Colhane of Minneapolis, Company D of the one, uh, two of the 135 infantry. I'm not sure how to turn this off. Normandy, Italy really had become something of a forgotten front. 
the merits of the Italian campaign can always be, be, be debated, but I don't think anyone can fail to appreciate the dog faces of the 34th. It may have been a hard luck division, but their tenacity, bravery, and skill in the face of great hardships and dangers are something that all of us can be deeply proud of. Thanks very much. Representative of, of the uh, history of the 34th tonight, Jack, you did a wonderful job, and, and I really appreciate that. The thing I guess I would really hope that the Minnesota Military Museum would continue to do is to collect these histories as we're trying to do tonight, and uh, we will certainly contribute a tape of this, and uh, there's probably six or seven thousand others that maybe need to be collected. As we do with each of our programs, we try to relive this with some of the personal memories of the people that fought there. Our first uh, speaker and I will introduce them and then we will give them the floor. Uh, Major General Don Grant, who started as a uh, first lieutenant in the 151st Artillery and ended up as the battalion commander of the 185th Artillery. Ray Schultz was the second on your right. Uh, Ray was in Company F, 134th Infantry, out of Wauseka, and uh, became such a veteran that they uh, recycled him into Company A of the 135th, but the 135th wouldn't let him go. Archie Shrewsbury was a uh, private, later Buck Sergeant in the 151st, and of course many of you may have known him over at the University of Minnesota ROTC uh, department. Norb McCrady was in Company F of the 134th and was a scout in the 2nd Battalion. And General Jack Vesey, uh, who must have had every rank in the military, was a first sergeant in the Division Artillery for the 134th. So those are our group of speakers. One of the things I, I uh, would like to uh, say, and I think it really talks about the leadership that must have been in the 34th. When we first started assembling the program, we ended up with a lot of artillery guys. And General Grant said, I'm not going to be on the program if you don't, don't have some dog faces. <laughs> General Grant. You. <laughs> a lot of my thunder. Go on. <laughs> I uh, have some real key points, and they're well covered. So I'm just going to trace from induction until we came home. Uh, we stayed at the Armory in Minneapolis, 151st. Can you hear me? No. Sounds to me like I can't project. There you go. All right. Uh, we were called in on February 10th, and uh, stayed in the Armory for about two weeks. I was put in a rather relatively junior first lieutenant in command of a battalion of artillery trucks to take them down to Claiborne. And it was an interesting ride. We didn't have any problem. We were lost most of the time. <laughs> when we uh, got to Kansas City, we were to park our trucks in the basement of their convention center. Well, the police met us at the boundary of the town and said, follow me. And they took off at 50 miles an hour. Well, we were still looking for trucks at midnight. It was 5 o'clock. We had trucks rolling all over. We did get them all back <laughs> and proceeded to the rest of the trip without any difficulty. But uh, when we got to Claiborne, I don't know how many of you can remember, but it was mud. We talked about mud in Italy and so forth. But there was mud. And we drove a truck into the Battery Street and it just gently settled down until we were riding on the truck body. Had to A-frame back out. 
but uh, the artillery had to have service practice. And we went out in the field in order to get the guns and trucks into position. We had to build a corduroy road, which was uh, something new because we weren't engineers. But uh, it was the first few months were sent spent sending people to school. I'm sure that happened in the infantry. I, I can only look through my knot hole, which is a artillery knot hole. But we sent people as fast as we could to the, the service schools. And uh, we were able to start reorganizing all of a sudden somebody started a war. So I'm less than a month later, we were on our way to Dix to be staged for overseas. We didn't know it. We just stopped moving to Dix. And it was probably the coldest winter they ever had at Fort Dix. We burned down a tent a day with the wooden stoves and uh, didn't know where we were going. We finally realized we were going someplace, but uh, uh, and we didn't know we were trying to we went over as the 1st Battalion of the 151st. And the 2nd Battalion never came. It became the 2nd Battalion of the 175th. 1st Battalion of the 175th. And we, uh, I was fortunate. I didn't spend all my time in the tent. I got married at Fort Dix three days before I went overseas. So I did have two nights in the officer's club. <laughs> out of the cold. <laughs> and uh, we arrived in Ireland after we, when we left. You wouldn't believe the convoy we had. We had two ships and a battleship, a cruiser, and I don't know how many. Uh, what's the little destroyers? Destroyers. They were they were had us bundled up. And when we got opposite of Iceland, the other ship took off. And we got up in the morning and there wasn't a ship in the whole sea except ours. <laughs> Looked out the window and, and finally somebody, Gene Sertic and I were looking, what's that over there? It looked like a piece of rubbish in, in the water. And it was a Corvette, which is a British equivalent uh, of destroyers. And they, uh, British took over. That was their protection. Two Corvettes. <laughs> but we made it and landed in Ireland and uh, they gave us a sandwich and put us on a train and we went to Bellamina, a little town uh, on Lock Foyle, where, near Liverpool. And the uh, Irish people thought we were the silent army. We had rubber, rubber heels, and I don't know if you remember the British boots, but when they stand for you, they did from South Dakota. And, uh, but we were, the whole battalion of us walking along, and they didn't even hear us. They had their lights out and were watching us pretty carefully. We were uh, then issued the 25-pounder. The 25-pounder was developed because it had 360-degree travers. We didn't, uh, and the British developed it after their fiasco of trying to get being surrounded by tanks. And we couldn't, it only take them in a fan about like that. So uh, we were issued 25 pounders and trained with them for uh, well, the whole time we were there. We went up in the Sparrow Mountain at service practice and we went to Hulk's Park Point and uh, had, had a tank practice. And we, uh, we kind of liked the gun after a while. It, it, was, it looked like it was put together with a little haywire and uh, tape. But it did a job. It was relatively short uh, range. It fired up to about 13,000 feet yards, rather. And, uh, but when you got up around 13,000 yards, the whole thing would almost come apart. 
fuck a sheep in the face. <laughs> stopped there, we stayed there for 30 days. The General said, this is where we stopped, and we did stop. After 30 days, we went on to the, to the fund to pass. The infantry took it. We helped with throwing shells over their head. And we were taken out and staged for 609. That was a miserable hill. Just climbing it was... It was almost impossible, inviting it. I had nothing but admiration for the, the infantry. Uh, the artillery had nothing to do. We couldn't capture anything, we couldn't do a thing, but we had to try to support infantry. Now I, uh, while we, right after we took 609, we were issued uh, 105 houses and given 24 hours to familiarize ourselves with them and go back into combat. And uh, within two, three days, we went through the Chiriguri Pass, and the war was over, as far as in a, in Italy. But uh, I had an interesting job for, I was told as of Tunis for a short time. I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> my biggest trouble was uh, soldiers throwing hand grenades in the Bay of Tunis and getting fish. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had to appear before the Bay or the Day, I don't know what I get confused with B, Y, and D, Y. Both of them are officials in the government. He made it known in certain terms that that had stopped. <laughs> oh, after a while, we went back to Iran, staged for commanding Salerno. Well, the 151st, as was mentioned, saved the beachhead. And when we arrived, uh, we landed at Salerno, and I got my most serious wound. I was eating cornflakes and sugar and milk. And he, he rolled in on it. <laughs> and he, he, he kicked me three times before I could spit him out. <laughs> One of the, incidentally, says Sam Wenskamp went into the Rangers. He was a big, husky, strong man. And they put him right driving a jeep instead of making a combat soldier. But then we, uh, I went through Italy most of the, we crossed the Volturno three times. Actually, I crossed it four. There was, after the third crossing, we went up and we leave the French, and we had to cross the river there, but that was all, it was peaceful. We had to fight our way through the other. And, uh, Speaking of the 168th Infantry's results on Mount Pantano, they lost four battalion commanders in two hours. So there were captains commanding battalions when it fell. Fourth got was practically non-existent when we went through Rome. 
as D-Day was cooking, we went on towards Chivitavecchia. Chivitavecchia was the first good-sized town on the coast on the way up to Leghorn, Livorno, I guess is the proper word. And we saw what we were shooting at us. They had a 170 gun, which would fire 30,000 yards, 40,000. It was railroad mounted. And uh, it was awestruck. Just just to see the damn thing. It was in rail yards. It was ours then. But I was in, then in the 185th. And the 185th had Schneiders. Uh, Schneiders, a 155 house <coughs> from World War I. And the smooth board. We were afraid to ram them good when we would put the shell in and seat it. If you hit it too hard, we were afraid it'd spit out the end because we'd worn the ends we warned the ends out. And uh, then we were in position once we were back in the line where we had lots of ammunition for Schneiders and we had M1s. There was no firing table for it, so we had to produce our own firing table. Two observers fired where it hit the water. Was the new firing information we needed to fire the gun? Well, I was I was saved the problems of it. I designed it, and then, then I went home for 30 days of recuperation, rehabilitation. <laughs> Good time. And my, when I got back, they were in the north of uh, Florence. That winter and that spring, we burst into Florence, but I, I, I disagreed with my previous. The, uh, we were held outside of Bologna, and some other, I think it was the British, were first in. And uh, so we went up the uh, Old River Valley rather rapidly. and. You can't imagine some of the poor equipment that those guys, those Germans, did with such skill. They even had horses on the horse-drawn artillery. And I hadn't been, I had joined the horse artillery in, in 1928, and uh, we didn't have any horses after 31. But uh, it was an interesting ride, and I'm, I'm like an old soldier friend of mine says, World War One. World War II were passed by my house and I was sitting on the porch. I wouldn't turn my head to look at it. But I wouldn't take a million dollars from my experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and if I could, uh, Don Frederick is one of those uh, 135th guys that was in the first Rangers. Are there any other Rangers that came out of the 134th in the audience? Don, would you raise your hand? 135th. Oh, 135th, I'm sorry. Yeah. Don has been our speaker. Uh, I'm not correct that I was in Bradley F-151 artillery when I left to the Rangers. That's a pretty tough act. Oh, man. <laughs> pretty tough act to follow here. Sounds like all he did was fun all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll try to give you a little picture of uh, one man's travel through the, uh, through the system of going to war. And for my uh, start, it all began in 1941 when Company F-135th and Virginia Minnesota National Guard located in Oklahoma uh, was in the process of soliciting recruits for one-year enlistments. And I, like a lot of 18-year-olds with the prospect of a job, without a prospect of a job, saw this as an opportunity to see this, some of the world. There were 13 of us from Wasika who signed on and were sworn in on February the 10th. We spent 15 days preparing to leave for Camp Sidebourne, Louisiana on February 25th. Our training began almost as soon as we arrived. I had the good fortune of being able to use a typewriter 
So I became the assistant company clerk and avoided most of the company training. In early August, we took part in the Louisiana Cougars. Sent to pick us up. 
We wandered for two days in the desert before finding our company. The next incident occurred at Fondue on March 27th to the 30th with 51 Purple Hearts, two killed in action, no advance. The second Fondue on April 8th, we tried it again. This time we succeeded on April 8th and got through on April 8th and got out of there with 31 Purple Hearts and four killed in action. This is pretty much a single company's picture here rather than a battalion or anything like that. So it's, it's kind of interesting how this all, all plays out. The next incident was Hill 609 with both of those gentlemen talked about. Our company had 32 Purple Hearts and two killed in action in that, that situation. And this was the end of the African campaign. Uh, just prior to leaving Africa for the trip to Italy, I happened to be in the first sergeant's tent. There was a memo on his desk transferring six of F Company's finest, or heroes, three to the 1st Battalion and three to the 3rd. My name was first on the list and I landed in A Company. We left for Italy on September 15th, landed at the Gulf of Salerno. And while in A Company of the 1st Battalion, we were engaged in battles at Salerno. Eight Purple Hearts, one killed. Mount Alavito, three Purple Hearts. Mount Trocchio, 17 Purple Hearts, and three in action. San Angelo, 20 Purple Hearts, one killed in action. Monte Cassino, 21 Purple Hearts, three killed in action. Manzio, 63 Purple Hearts, and two killed in action. Rosignano, 33 Purple Hearts, and three killed in action. These are a sample of the the battalion's activity with our, our particular company, so it gives you some kind of an idea of what was going on. <coughs> yeah. I was wounded at Monte Casino. On February Earth returned to duty with A Company at Anzio. On May the 23rd, the breakout from Anzio began and was completed on 26th of May. On May 27th, the 100th Battalion joined this regiment. This is a battalion of Nisis from uh, Hawaii. On May the 31st, the regiment continued to attack, and on June 5th, entered Rome. The regiment continued north, although the pace was slow because of the mountainous terrain and periodic clashes with the enemy. I returned to the States in October on points, furloughed January 1st, 1945, and was assigned to a German POW camp for Africa Corps veterans. And I was assigned as an NCO for one of the POW companies. In the compound, he's charged with the daily reports and their assignments and other activities, most of which took place in the Cleveland area war plants. This group was made up of some of Hitler's finest and was subject to strict discipline. The first sergeant of my unit was a longtime veteran and a very interesting soldier. Remember, uh, remember the 13 enlistees from Wasika I started out with? Five were killed in action, nine Purple Hearts, and two Oak Leaf Clusters. And I close this out with the two companies that took up most of my time. Company F, Purple Hearts, 560. Killed in action, 112. Company A, Purple Hearts, 44, 400, 4,000, or 447. And KIA is 80. Uh, and this is all, this is one company. We're now with the 5,000 Purple Hearts, 2,000 Kill in Action, and so on. So this is kind of a picture of what happened to one, one company. Thank you. <laughs> I committed marriage and divorce. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and I worked in uh, the harvest, uh, work, uh, harvesting Elsac clover up in Kujiching County, way up on the Canadian border. And uh, so, uh, uh, getting into the army, I should have been able to uh, not be surprised. However, uh, <laughs> With all of that background, I was still totally unprepared for what I was going to encounter when I joined the Guard. Ed Horning and I joined the Guard uh, together, talked into it by Joe Polivchak, a kid in our neighborhood, who was a sergeant in E-Battery. And uh, Ed was able to get in right away. Uh, this was in the in the fall of 1940 when uh, they'd been alerted that they were going to be federalized. One of the older guys dropped out and Ed got in. But I had to wait about six weeks before uh, there was an opening where I could get in. When I finally made it, I said to Joe, as we were riding home on the Grand Monroe streetcar, well, Joe, I finally made it. Now I can go south with you guys. He said, cut out that Joe shit, Shrewsbury. My name is Sergeant Polivjack, and don't you forget it. <laughs> so the time for my enlistment in the Guard until we were activated was mainly spent in learning the, the rank structure and the names of the, of the men in the battery. I learned some of the terminology, fall in, fall out, at ease. <laughs> All attempted by some guy that was uh, trying to sound basso profundo when he was talking. <laughs> our, our uniforms were an amalgam of uh, horse artillery clothing that uh, used boots with leather face puttees over the, over breeches so that they uh, puffed way out on the sides. They looked kind of ridiculous, but uh, that's what we had when we were first enlisted. Our shirts were a little bit more acceptably styled, but uh, and the campaign hats. In E Battery that I joined, you had to have a Stetson uh, campaign hat. You had to buy it yourself. So, but just uh, just before we were federalized, uh, clothing came through so that we did get uh, the, a normal OD uniform, uh, trousers and shoes. So. Uh, that allowed us to wear canvas laced up leggings as most of you guys are familiar with. And we also uh, we learned a few raucous and lewd songs that were a source of embarrassment to the moms and the wives and sweethearts that came down to the army to watch us as we were drilling. Uh, I'll give you one of them. Our captain's a lantern-jawed bastard. Our first lieutenant drink gin. Our second lieutenant's a fairy. My God, what an outfit we're in. Gin, gin, sin. My God, what an outfit we're in. I've been singled out as a truck driver. So at the end of February, Dick Sandy and I got into this uh, into the 1933 Chevy and we fell in, in the convoy that was led by uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was about a 1,200 mile trip and uh, that was the longest as far as I've been able to uh, determine uh, the longest military convoy that had ever been taken undertaken in the United States at that time. Oh. And we bedded down in armories and auditoriums and, and uh, they messed us uh, at night and at breakfast in these various places uh, that we would encamp. And then they would make up sandwiches for us to take for the noon meal. And it was the old army stable. Staple. Ham, jam, and cheese. And an apple. And the, the liquid or the, the, the drink was water. Unless you were able to break down on some roadside stand or a bar or someplace, run in and make a purchase. Uh, I know going through Arkansas, we were able to 
buy a real good wine that they sold in some of these, these uh, roadside stands. And as far as I can see right now, the only thing that I've ever encountered in Arkansas that was a product that was worth even taking a second look at was that wine. <laughs> Claiborne was less than less auspicious. True, the band was there to greet us as the trucks rolled into camp. However, they were up to their knees in the shittiest looking mud we'd ever seen. <laughs> the winter months were as celebrated in Louisiana with rain as Minnesota is with snow. So you get the picture. Hmm. The armed forces in early 1941 were ill-prepared for the impending global conflict, but the servicemen were more amenable to training than any that uh, has been encountered since then, and I'll tell you why. First, we did emerge from the longest depression that the nation had ever suffered. So these, the men knew what hardships were. Additionally, there were a high percentage of farm-raised men who came to us initially uh, in, in uh, 34th Division from the Dakotas, Montana, some of them was Wisconsin, and the rest of them from Minnesota. They were tough, they knew how to work. <clears throat> and additionally to that, we had an officer corps whose members had been schooled in World War I, many of them, and they had been victorious in fighting the Kaiser and his army, so we had good leadership. <clears throat> now, when we were in Claiborne, the work began. How do you shape a bunch of guys of divergent backgrounds into a cohesive fighting force? A training schedule was established and followed as closely as possible considering the conditions. If you recall, KP was one of the more onerous tasks. We started at 3 o'clock in the morning because we had wood-burning stoves, or I should say uh, fire-burning stoves. It was started with wood and finished off with coal. And that was the job for the KPs to get those fires started. And you had three stoves and a water heater that had to be kindled and lit, and the coal was added. And Bins were refilled and the grease pits were cleaned and the pots were washed and the vegetables peeled and cleaned and the food served and the floors swept and mopped and tables were scrubbed. All of those tasks were completed about an hour after the last meal. <laughs> and due to an altercation, I'm sure it would shock you to be able to realize that I'd have an altercation, but uh, <laughs> due to the altercation, I uh, managed to get transferred to service battery out of E-Battery. A newly formed concept that was part of the triangular division concept. That is, when we were federalized, there was no service battery. There was a headquarters and service company, or a battery, and then it was split up to where the service battery was a separate uh, unit within the battalion. So that's how I got into the service battery. The service battery covered the, the handling of food, clothing, ammunition, tendons, bedding, tools, and, and preservatives, oils, and lubricants. We were woefully under strength until we received our first draftees in late April. We were fortunate that our new men were from small towns and farms in Minnesota, the Dakotas, and Montana. Our training schedule needed severe adjustment. Service battery worked continuously for 90 days. The whole camp was a sea of mud, and valuable time was needed for ditching and training, and draining. Then hauling, hauling gravel and crushed seashells to cover the drained land. Boardwalks had to be built and installed in the battery street, leading to our pyramidal tent billets. All of this was in addition to KP, guard duty, latrine orderly, battalion runner, and the need to follow the training schedule, a portion of which was commander's time. It was spent giving information on current news and events because there was very few radios in the outfit and very little time for anyone to listen to it. 
There were daily sessions of close order drill and the teaching of customs and courtesies of the service. All communication uh, classes covered both the use of radios and telephones. The e WE8 uh, telephone and the 536 radios. Physical training and cross country hiking to include field sanitation, daily inspections of living quarters, and a weekly inspection to include a full field layout of all the clothing and equipment. There was a, the necessity of learning the 11 orders of the guard. It was a weekly battalion sized parade and review with the full division artillery band providing the cadence and the music and the pageantry. By most civilian standards, this was a Herculean effort. But to our farm boy draftees, it was considered trivial duty. They were allowed to lay in bed until 0500. <laughs> the daily schedule ended with the retreat formation a little after 1700 hours. Their only distress was the knowledge that they were sorely needed at home. The, de the decision finally came to allow some respite in the daily grind, and we were trucked up to Shreveport. Each man had to show money necessary to cover a three-day pass that included hotel fare. Our first outcome <coughs> camp had this expected effect. The majority of us got soused, became raucous and rowdy, got in fights, got laid, took our first prophylaxis, or prophylaxes as the case may be, and got as feculent and sick as possible. We were editorially invited to stay away. <laughs> our return to camp got us back on track trying to create a fighting force with drill and lots of memory work depending on individual assignments. From morning PT on to cannoneers, hop for the gun crews, to the proper radio terminology for the communication section, and the unending form, form numbers and manuals for clerks and supply people. To close all of this down, I'd like to point out some of the things we encountered. It was a rare Cajun farmhouse that didn't have a loaf of quartermaster bread as a doorstop because the quartermaster corps was trying to develop a, a bread that had a hard enough crust to where it could be handled properly and still be palatable. They had a lot of miserable failures and they were all the way. I well remember the snakes, the corals, the pygmy rattlers, the water moccasins, the scorpions and tarantulas were in abundance and of course the chiggers, commonly called red bugs, in most of Louisiana, there is an open range law, so fences were unnecessary, and there were quite a few scruffy-looking cows and horses, and many razorback hogs that were wild. Lots of possums and armadillos, lots of swamps and bayous. And last, but not least, the heavenly scent of the enormous magnolias that grow wild in the bayous. One other thing. If you recall, when we got into those mess halls, the cooks somehow were giving us saltpeter to reduce the libido. And I find that the saltpeter is actually beginning to take effect. censoring, 
they wanted to see mine in advance because he looks much more reserved than I do. And uh, so they were sure that he wouldn't use any vulgarity. They censored mine and re-edited it, and uh, only the words have been changed to protect the innocent. My apologies to the purists in the audience who will notice the difference. It went like this. Idy dighty, sakes all Friday, who the heck are we? Rip ram, gal darn, we're the infantry. We're Colonel Nelson's troopers, we're riders of the night. We don't claim to be the nicest chaps. There's things we'd rather do than fight. <laughs> now, if, uh, if you think that song would have survived from November 11th, 1918 until 1941 when we went in the service with those words, you're full of it up to your ears. <laughs> so our next speaker, Jack Vesey, who I'm certainly proud to call an acquaintance and, a, and more so a friend, both of us joined the 34th Division in 1938. We didn't know each other at the time, but we were both approximately 15 years old. People have asked us, what did you do? Lie about your age? Absolutely not. We both exaggerated it a little bit. <laughs> Jack and I both joined as uh, privates, of course, and uh, I got out in 1945 as a PFC. Jack got out as a four-star general. I guess I don't have to tell you who had the answers to the test. <laughs> when we joined, it was less than 20 years after the November 11th, 1918 armistice that we, yeah. most of us at our age in this group, uh, remember as the real Veterans Day, November 11th. Uh, in our organization, our regimental commander, Harold S. Nelson, our company commander, Hugh Soper, our mess sergeant, Max Montai, and our supply sergeant, Pepper Shavi, had all served in the Mexican border incident prior to World War I, chasing Pancho Villa. And uh, in fact, I came from a town where they pronounced it Villa for so long that I didn't know that it was the same guy. <laughs> Uh, it was some of these veterans from the American Expeditionary Forces of World War I that taught us some of the classic songs in the First World War. Not all those songs made it to Carnegie Hall, like this edited version of Mademoiselle from Armentiers. The first division went over the top, parlez-vous. The second division went over the top, parlez-vous. The third division stayed behind, now get this, to entertain the ladies while sipping wine. <laughs> that guy knew Shrewsbury, how'd you get that stuff through that you were <laughs> When I joined in 38, we were still wearing wrap leggings in the infantry, and uh, we were using the Springfield 03 rifle, and uh, the BAR was the big gun. We didn't even have mortars at that time. And uh, we got over... I'll kind of jump over to uh, when we got down into Africa. Our battalion commander, Jess Lee, was a former deputy sheriff, so he knew me, and you know, deputy sheriffs had a tendency to know me at that time. So and he said, uh, Mac, I'd like to have you be my battalion scout. And I said, sure. I don't know what the hell I was thinking of. You know, I never read the 21-100 to find out what it said about what a scout did for a living. All I remember that back home, they you know, they tied knots and they uh, <laughs> started fires by rubbing sticks together. They helped little old ladies across the street uh, and they slept in tents. Now, out of those four things, the only thing that I found out that a scout did, he slept in a tent. <laughs> but that was the only, the only the first of many career mistakes I made both in and out of the Army. I marched in the Victory Parade in Tunis, which was pretty exciting. I suppose especially for those on the reviewing stand, which consisted of, I think, you know, I don't remember all of them, but I think they said Churchill and, and uh, Eisenhower and Montgomery and de Gaulle and Sir Harold Alexander and I don't know who all, but it was an impressive array. As I walked by, I nodded at them just to show them that I did appreciate them being there. <laughs> when I got back to Iran, we were getting ready to go and land somewhere else. They didn't tell us where. And I was a PFC, so if they didn't tell me. I'm sure they didn't tell anybody else either. And uh, I knew it was time for a career change. So I went out and took driver's training tests. And it was, you know, kind of something different than being a battalion scout which I found I didn't like at all. And, uh, but I had no idea 
uh, company commander asked me if I'd be his driver after I passed my exam, and I had no idea what a com uh, company commander's driver did for a living, so I said, sure. Well, uh, to make the uh, long story short, when I was driving for him, he got the Distinguished Service Cross, and all I got was I got my good conduct ribbon back that they'd taken away from me back in Claymore. <laughs> In the course of the Italian campaign, uh, I got stabbed. Now, this was not by the enemy, although I certainly would call the guy a friend. <laughs> we were, uh, it was uh, Thanksgiving Day, and uh, so we were having a little card game, and there were two fellows right close to us, uh, one of whom uh, was embracing the other one's neck with his hands until he thought it was purple. And we kept saying, Gibson, knock it off, Gibson, knock it off. In the Army, in the infantry, you really didn't stop people from choking someone else. Uh, it was kind of metal, considered it meddling, you know, that you kind of let them do their own thing. But pretty soon this fellow went limp, and he's purple, so I got up and cracked him one in the mouth. And, with that, he pulled a knife and stabbed me in the knee, and I got an infection, and I ended up in a back hospital, and I had a cast, a leg long cast on. And of all times, I get there, and that morning, a guy came from my outfit. He knew I liked, uh, he knew I liked cognac. He knew I liked anything with alcohol in it. In fact, and he came with a bottle of cognac, and I stuck it under my mattress there, and, and uh, he left. And I thought, well, I'll have some after a while. So. When he left, about five minutes later, I started having some. And uh, then Leo DeRocher came with some ball players. And, you know, it's pretty exciting. In, in our hometown, down in Oatana, you were lucky to see the people from Faribault. <laughs> so here's Leo DeRocher and these ball players, and we're pretty excited. We're all, so by then, I'm hitting a few more cognac, and Leo comes around. He shook my hand. Naturally, he'd want to see me. And, uh, we, we visited a little bit, and he said, are you coming over to the thing tonight? And I said, well, I can't. They had little catwalks about this wide, and the mud was about this deep right alongside of them, and I'm on crutches. You can't get crutches on a catwalk that wide, you know. So I kind of feeling sorry for myself. I had quite a bit of cognac, and in fact, the bottle started showing signs of being half empty rather than half full. And... Uh, about that time, I thought, you know, those crutches probably would work on that dog. Uh, I tried it real hard and was careful. I went out, tried it, and it fell flat on my face in the mud. Fortunately, some guy came along because with a leg, uh, full leg cast, you can't really do much bouncing out of the mud, you know. And this guy came along, a big, hulking fellow, and he said, What's the matter, soldier? He said, Did you fall down? I said, No, man, I'm a nice sleep here, fellow. <laughs> Well, he picked me up, and, and he hauled me back into the tent. He asked me what tent I was in, and I, all I remembered was it, was it was a canvas one. And we went back in there, and they started scrubbing me up, and they had nurses coming, and they are getting me all cleaned up. With that, the guy took off his uh, raincoat. It turned out he was a major. And, uh, at, uh, <clears throat> I tried to apologize, and he said, no, it's really a kind of a stupid question to ask. Yeah, <laughs> I was driving for this fellow that got the Distinguished, Cross, Distinguished Service Cross, and he's a past president of the 34th Division Association, Al Lance, from Savannah, Missouri. Some of you have heard of him. And uh, so he was, he was a, quite a famous company commander. When they'd get into a spot where they wanted to go on a fast overnight raid, and they were going to have an attack at 2 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, they'd call Lance into division headquarters rather than get the briefing at regimental or battalion level. And so I'd drive him in there. And so it was not uncommon for me to see Charlie Ryder when he was uh, division commander. And I also, when my company commander was there, and we'd meet Ryder or any other senior officer, my company commander would salute, you know, in the Jeep. And so when he wasn't there, I thought, well, somebody's got to do it. So I'm driving along. I see General Ryder. I salute. Ryder smiles at me, and he salutes back. And he smiles, and he's looking at his driver. He's looking at me, and I thought, geez, what a nice guy. He not only salutes back, but he smiles at you. Just a real decent guy. This happened on at least a dozen occasions until uh, one time I was talking to someone and, uh, and I was telling him, what a nice guy he is. He salutes back. And he said, you dummy, the driver doesn't salute when the general does it. Well, anyhow, Charlie kept on every time I'd see him. One time I, my attention was diverted. I'm driving along and I look back and here comes the general's Car, and the general saluting me before I even saluted him who it was. <laughs> I was driving.
driving in Oran after we were, we're uh, getting ready to go to Italy, and I was driving in Oran. The company commander said, "Get out, get some practice driving that jeep. I don't want to be riding with an amateur." <laughs> and uh, so two fellows, tall, handsome, no insignia or anything, walking down the street, and I thought, "Well, they look like a couple of decent chaps." I stopped and said, "You guys want to ride?" And they looked at each other and they smiled. And they said, "Sure." So they hopped in the back of my jeep, and I said, uh, "What outfit?" They said, we're Navy. I said, oh, where's your boat? And well, they don't call them boats, you know, but they smile and they say, get down on the pier. And I said, is that where you're going? Yes, it is, as a matter of fact. Well, I said, I'll give you a ride down there and show me how to get down there. So they pointed this way and that way. And we got down on the pier and we're driving down. We get down to their boat and all of a sudden, whistles are blowing and there's people standing and present arms and saluting and yelling out attention and everything. And I thought, God, I've never had this much attention in my life. For a little Jeep driver, I'm getting all this kind of attention. It was really impressive to me until I found out there's the guys in the back end that were doing this. And they said, now, come on, we want you to come up uh, on the ship. And, and I said, no, I can't. My company commander said, do not leave your Jeep. You stick with it because they steal them around here. I said, don't worry about it. We'll put a couple guards on duty, which they did. A couple guys with rifles stood there ready to fight anybody who was going to try and steal their Jeep. And they got up on the boat. And they took me down a little corridor, and here was a fellow in a window, like a, like a bar, you know. And uh, these two chaps came up to him and said, now give this fellow all the candy and cigarettes that he can hold. And they said, thanks for the ride. I said, that's okay. And they walked on. And so they started giving me, like, cases and cases, uh, cartons and cartons of cigarettes. And what kind of candy bars do you like? Milky Way. Here's five cartons of Milky Way. I said, no, no. I said, no. A carton of candy and a couple of cartons of cigarettes, that's fine. He says, look, when the Admiral says, give him all he can hold. <laughs> that was the two guys that I made. <laughs> uh, when, uh, when I got out of the Army, when I was about to get out of the Army, you know, the first sergeant came to me. Now, Jack was the first sergeant, but this is no reflection on him because at any rank, Jack was a gentleman, and I, I don't know. But this first sergeant was that I'm talking about was not a gentleman. He was a horse's ass. You know? <laughs> so he came to me and he said, you know, it's part of my duty to ask you to re-enlist. He said, we're going to have an army of occupation over here, and we'd like to have you re-enlist. He said, uh, I know you don't like me, and he said, I expect that you'll turn me down, but he said, I, I have to do it. It's part of my job. And I said, Sergeant, I wouldn't stay in this man's army as long as you're a part of it. If you gave me a $10,000 bonus, I don't care what the rewards are. No, no, no. He said, that doesn't surprise me, McCready. He said, you and I have never gotten along. Never. And he said, in fact, I've always kind of thought that... Uh, we get out of this army, the war is over, we go home, you hear that I've died, you're going to find out where I'm buried, you're going to come and pee on my grave. I said, no, you don't have to worry about that, Sergeant. A long time ago, I made up my mind, once I get out of this man's army, I'll never stand in line for anything. <laughs> Because I had uh, the same experiences as these people had. You don't want to hear another rehash of what happened to the 34th Division in World War II. And I thought I might end the evening by telling you a little bit about the perspective that uh, the experience of World War II had for me and brought to the subsequent 40-some uh, years of military service that I had and the opportunity to serve in uh, in fairly senior positions as uh, either as vice chief of the army or chairman of the joint chiefs or commander in Korea and things of that nature. They, the, uh, and it's time for the United States to look at its defenses uh, for the years ahead. Uh, Yogi Berra, one of the great 
contemporary American philosopher said, when you come to a fork in the road, be sure you take it. <laughs> the, end of, the end of the Cold War, uh, with, the, with the outside world changing dramatically, with uh, us looking forward to a world which will contain, by the year 2035, twice as many people as it had when the Berlin Wall fell, uh, with us not quite knowing what the future holds, it's time for America to look again seriously at its defenses for the years ahead. And there are some lessons from this experience, it seems to me, that are worth, worth drawing. Uh, after listening to these guys here, except uh, these last two, I think uh, it might be well to, to listen to Jack Johnson again to understand what, in fact, the 34th Division accomplished. Jack raised the question, uh, was the Italian campaign worthwhile? Well, I think if one looks at the number of German divisions that were tied down and asked what would have happened at Normandy had those German divisions been available to oppose the landing in Normandy, I think you can come up with the, with the argument that yes, the Italian campaign was worthwhile. If one goes to Normandy and looks at the, at the cemeteries there and sees the price that we paid, which was really the price for being not ready for World War II during the 20s and the 30s. And if you can imagine what those cemeteries would look like had those top-notch German divisions that were in Italy but available to oppose the landing in Normandy, uh, I think you can understand that the campaign was well worthwhile and that the sacrifices were worthwhile. We talked a little bit, uh, we heard a little bit about the, the Battle of Casino. Jack uh, uh, suggested that it was probably the defining battle for the 34th Division, and I would suggest that's probably correct. Many years later, when I was a student at the Command and General Staff College, my desk mate, my seat mate, was, a, was an Austrian officer whose last name happened to be Osterreicher, which means Austrian. Uh, but he was in the German army in World War II, and he was in the 1st German Parachute Division, which were the defenders at Casino. And uh, he and most of the rest of the German army believed that that was the best division of the German army, so we know the sort of opposition that the 34th faced. As Jack pointed out, the division was a National Guard division, and it uh, had its roots in the great American militia tradition. Uh, Jack said that the division fought gallantly and was recognized as such, and that's true, but you can pick up history books. Uh, you pick up uh, even General Bradley's book, which talks about General Anderson, uh, the commander of the British First Army, asking that the 34th Division either be disbanded or pulled out of the line and go back for retraining. Because Anderson was, uh, uh, thought that the, the 34th Division's performance at Fonduc was uh, inadequate. That sort of tag has crept into more history books than the history of what the 34th Division actually did. In fact, a few months ago, the history of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is being rewritten. And my little part was sent to me uh, to review. And uh, what I, I will just tell you that I'll read a few lines from the, from the letter that I sent to the historian. Uh, the first part concerning the division was, I said, another bit of great discomfort for me comes from the second paragraph in the words about the 34th Division. And I go on to say, I realize that General Bradley's book, among others, has the story about Anderson suggesting the withdrawal and retraining of the 34th. I said the story may well be correct. But like all the rest of the United States Army in North Africa, including the senior commanders, the 34th was not inhibited by lack of room for improvement. We didn't necessarily look particularly good, but we certainly fought as well as any other division. And then I went on at some, some length about what the 34th Division had actually done. Uh, 
And in the end, I said uh, that, uh, uh, and from all this, if you come to the conclusion that I don't want anything even faintly derogatory about the 34th in an article about me, you're absolutely correct. <laughs> and if the audience wants to read the blatherings of generals trying to shift blame for their own ineptness in Tunisia to the 34th, let them read a different book. <laughs> had on the Army uh, through the intervening years, one can understand the actual contribution of the 34th Division. You look at uh, the people that it produced in the regular Army. We didn't have a lot of regular Army officers uh, in World War II uh, with the division, but some grew out of the division into the regular Army. Uh, uh, General Balti, who was the second commander of the division during the war, who later was the vice chief of staff of the army, and probably one of the finest officers the army ever had, uh, who could have worn combat patches from many different divisions. He always wore the 34th Division patch. Uh, Ken Mearns, who commanded that battalion of the 135th that got up around the top of the casino there, later uh, a lieutenant general, a corps commander in, in Europe, senior officer on the Army staff, always wore the 34th Division patch. Uh, and the same was true with many others, including me. I, I served in combat with, uh, with other regular Army divisions and commanded an outfit that uh, got the presidential unit citation, uh, but I always wore the 34th Division patch with great, great pride. That came because of certain, a certain uniqueness that, uh, that the National Guard Division uh, brought to the Army. Uh, general Anderson, the British general who suggested that the 34th ought to be retrained, said it was undisciplined. What I would say to you is that it may have been undisciplined in the sense that uh, Anderson looked at his own British troops, and in the sense that he might have gotten from listening to uh, the Nord <laughs> <laughs> talk about the division. But the thing that the 34th Division had that uh, was particularly rich, it had no indiscipline, no indiscipline. Uh, when one looks at indiscipline, I mean soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines who do the wrong things, who get in trouble for, uh, and get court-martialed for going absent without leave or whatever it is. Uh, I don't remember a court-martial of a National Guard soldier that came from the Midwest who went into the 34th Division. There certainly were some, probably. But I know of none. There's a tremendous source of strength that uh, the division brought to the Army. People-wise, we had uh, uh, people like Norman Hendrickson, and Fritz Peterson, uh, Don Grant, who were uh, Gene Sertig, who were stalwarts, and many, many others uh, uh, that uh, many of you could mention. Uh, who taught uh, people who served later on how to be real leaders, how to be human and be leaders. My own personal experience and the experiences that we had, which were cited here, particularly by, uh, by Jack, but also by the others, uh, led me to understand, as I told the, the historian here, I said that uh, the uh, I said, for the next 42 years, those who served with me suffered from my eccentricities about realistic combat training, about protecting soldiers, about modern equipment, about physical fitness, and air ground coordination. Those things led to uh, events that took place in the Army that, uh, that you saw on the battlefield at, uh, in Desert Storm. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I left Italy and North Africa with was the determination that we would find ways to train the Army of the future in 
take all the bang bang you're dead out of military training and make it as realistically uh, close to battle as we possibly could. And from that grew such things as the National Training Center, which is uh, completely instrumented uh, with uh, lasers that, uh, that uh, uh, simulate each of the weapons on the battlefield so that when the soldiers go and fight on that battlefield at the National Training Center, as the guardsmen here will tell you, uh, everything that's happened is instrumental. You can't say, I, I, I did it right, but it didn't turn out right, because whatever you said has been recorded. Uh, every shot you took was instrumented. Whether you hit or missed is instrumented. Uh, so that the soldier is trained to understand what happens on the battlefield. And certainly not everything goes right on the battlefield. But as the soldiers in Desert Storm would say afterward, it was almost as hard as the National Training Center. <laughs> uh, and that's what grew out of the experience of the 34th Division in, in North Africa in World War II, as well as the determination to provide our soldiers with, uh, with equipment that worked and that gave them a technological edge on the battlefield. Uh, in North Africa, as was mentioned, we didn't have a weapon that would uh, penetrate the front places with a turret of a German tank. If you wanted to make a hole in it, you had to get behind it. Uh, if we heard airplanes, we didn't look up because we knew they belonged to the Germans and not, uh, not to us. So those experiences permitted the rest of the army that came on later in the war to be better trained. But more importantly, it committed, permitted the army and the Navy and the Air Force and the Marine Corps that followed during the 50 years of the Cold War to be immensely better trained than we ever were. Now the question is, what will we do in the future? Our defense budgets are now down to about the percentage of the gross domestic product that they were in 1939. Uh, the armories of, of, of towns that had National Guard troops for uh, 75 years have been closed. Uh, and the question is, how will we in America ensure that the armed forces of the United States are tied to the people of the United States? And how will we ensure that we have enough of a force that is well trained enough to, to meet whatever tomorrow comes over the horizon. We don't know what it will be. Uh, many politicians will say, well, there aren't any enemies out there today. Uh, no, perhaps there aren't. There aren't any identifiable ones. But uh, surely uh, coalitions of nations, uh, mistakes by politicians, create the opportunities for enemies to arise. And we'll, they're far less likely to arise if we're prepared for it. So I think it's uh, important that we here uh, thank the, uh, the uh, World War II seminar for recording this particular uh, history. Uh, I'd like to pay tribute to my old friend, Dr. Harold Deutsch, for whom this seminar is named, and uh, Elizabeth, his widow, is here in the, in the hall with us tonight, and Don Patton for assembling this group, and uh, say thanks to my old comrades here for uh, providing us with not only history, but uh, a little entertainment, <laughs> uh, and thank you for coming. I know it's getting late. Uh, are there any real quick questions? Just take a couple and then we'll uh, just kind of break up here. Okay. Yes? How did uh, Minnesota lose the 34th Division and end up with the 47th instead? Since it was an integral part of the 34th, I'd be interested in having the use of spot for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The 34th Division was headquartered 
in Iowa before World War II. And uh, the, we had to create a division to give us one. So the 47th Division became the Minnesota Division. The 34th Division is back, but I, I think it's going to have some expenses with it. The, uh, eventually, Iowa's going to want the headquarters back. And uh, I think they, <clears throat> they're going to work at it. I hope we, we don't, they don't get it back. But uh, if they do, we won't have a headquarters. We won't have a division. That's my, that's my concern. My, but, my concern is, will we have any? Yeah. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yes, sir, in the back. I've got a question I have, and I don't remember where I got it. A particle of history, 134, and it was an official one from Allied or something or other. But it ended up on the 29th of September, 1944. Does anybody have any idea whether they've ever finished that up? Other than the very condensed version that I got from somewhere else. Or would that, anybody have any idea of where I might get yeah, it? Jack can answer the question. I'm not sure which one that you're referring to. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a partial one that I saw. Uh, which ultimately was was filled out to the end. But I would point out, we've got a book for sale here tonight on the history of the 135th. Uh, I think it's about 15 or 16 dollars, called To the Last Man. And that certainly takes it from the Civil War right up through into the 1970s. So you might want to think about that. I think that. I probably already have that. But it's, it's just that little stretch from September. And yeah. I, I went home on a furlough. Uh, in November, got back in January, and that last mad rush <laughs> up to Bologna and up the valley yeah. that uh, I can't find, you know, quite an official one the same as the other. Well, as I said, I, I, I think I know what you're talking about, but I'm not sure, so maybe you can talk to me afterwards. Yeah. The evening's getting long. Thank you for venturing out on a terrible winter night. Uh, would you like to come up? Filled with love for the suits. Love for the man holding the double boiler. For the teenaged girl with bare feet sucking the ends of her hair and watching the clock. Love for the lonesome one that the shoes will surely fit. From American experience, he was the great emancipator. She was the wealthy daughter of a slave owner. Drawn together by love and ambition. It's no accident that she fell in love with Abraham Lincoln. She somehow saw the depth of this man. Torn apart by a brutal war, 